So what I want to talk about is the biological control of acacias, but what I'm going to be talking, what I'm going to be saying could apply to any of the other ways of being used or targeted with biological control. So it's a generic sort of story, but using acacias as the, as the example. And my perception is that there's a lot of confusion out there as what to, we should be expecting about biological control, and that's leading to these sort of uh, statements, and you can go on this website, I don't know who Jeremy Kudes is, does anybody know him? Anyway, this is what he's put on a website, uh, and clearly he thinks that biological control of a case of saligna using a rust fungus is not working. In fact, he goes as far as to say that it was a waste of time and money, I believe. That there's still plenty of seeding, the plants are surviving, and he's uh, quite confident that he can make this statement because he doesn't think anything's happened. I think he might change his mind if he actually did some investigation and, and, and some, some, a little bit of research into what he's, what he's trying to say. By looking at some of the uh, literature that's available, which shows quite to the contrary that in fact urinaclading is having a huge impact on Acacia saligna. And I think it's rather like uh, climbing up a mountain. So I can use it as a simile. You set out to climb a mountain and you get some way up and you reach it, you come, come to a precipice which is absolutely insurpassable. And there's two things you can do. You can look ahead and say, well, we're never going to get to the top. Sorry, that's my pocket. We're never going to get to the top, so we fail. And you'll always be disappointed if you're looking ahead. Alternatively, you can look, you say, we're not going to get to the top, but look behind you and say, look how far we've come, look what we've achieved. And then you're always going to be pleased, you've actually done something. And then you can sit and sip your beer in the evening and be happy. So looking forward is going to be doom and gloom. Looking back is going to be happiness. And I want to use the impressions just to show looking backwards is quite an enlightening exercise. So, if we look at the Acacia program, it's been going for a long time. The first stage was released in 1982, 30 years ago. It tackles the Acacias as a suite of weeds, and that's a good thing to do because if you get rid of one, it's quite likely another will move into the void that's been created. So it's a good thing to treat them as a, as a single entity and tackle them all together. And as a result of that, we've introduced a lot of agents over this long period of time, and every occasion on this list has at least one biological control agent on it. Interestingly, and I think not surprisingly, there's only one, and again it's the rust fungus, and I've left that in black, because that is the only one that attacks the whole plant and destroys the trees completely. All the rest of these, the reds, the greens, and the blues, are insects that attack either the flower buds, the flowers, or the seeds. And the primary objective with these is just to reduce the seeding levels of the plant. And that's because lots of people are making lots of money out of vacations. Pulp, charcoal, furniture, firewood. And we have to respect that people want to use it, but if we can make them less invasive by using our seed insects, then we should do so. And what I want to do today is to take three of these species, Cyclops, Longifolia, and Mertia, and just look at them in a little more detail to show you what I mean by looking backwards is, 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 a, is a far more desirable way to go. Now, I'm using Longifolia because it's been going for a long time. I'm using Cyclops because we've been doing a lot of work on Cyclops. And I'm using Burns Yard because Burns Yard is a lots of exciting things happening for them. So if we look at Acacia longifolia, long leaf wattle, how many people can remember this sort of vista mm -hmm. in the Western Cape? Yeah, David. But there's not a lot of uh, not a lot of people who remember that if you drove around the Western Cape in the middle of the last century, maybe because you went around in the middle of the last century, <laughs> <laughs> this was a very common sight. Whole hillsides covered with acacia longifolia. And that's why people ranked acacia longifolia as usually as in the top three weeds in the country. And people were very concerned about this as a problem in the species. Okay. And that justified introducing the gall wasp, Trichelogaster, here's a little female, which lays the seeds in the flower buds and induces the gall to develop instead of the seeds, along with the seed beetle and the terriers, two insects that will stop the seeding capacity of these plants. Things got out of hand. This little wasp, which looked like nothing when it was released, it used to stagger around in little vials and looked like it never survived a day. It hit the ground running, and boring became incredibly abundant on the trees. So much so that besides stopping seeding, the trees were stressed 
very much by this high level of warning. And what happened is if you go around the Western Cape today, you'll still see longifolia growing along the rivers, and the guys who are looking forward are saying, look at all this longifolia, what a problem. But if you look at the mouth of size, it's gone. The plant can't tolerate that high level of boiling if it's at all water stressed, and it's disappeared from the mountain slopes. So here, if you're looking backwards up the mountain, it's a great achievement. If you just focus on what's left behind, you're going to be disappointed and say we haven't achieved anything. Next example, a case of cyclops. Yes, this is close, this is on the corner here, Cape St. Francis, a, a, a real invader, not a, not a Mickey Mouse about that. And again, we've got the gall fly in this case. Here's a little female laying her eggs now in the flower, the open flower, not the flower buds, and inducing these very distinctive galls to develop, each packed with several larvae, and a very prolific little insect, which has several generations a year, it builds up very rapidly, and it spreads very rapidly, it covers large distances. It's from Cinemos to East London in three years. And again, we have a seed beetle feeding on the seeds, both as adults as larvae, and destroying up to 70%, on average about 70% of the seed crop each year. So two very uh, prolific agents. Now, Debbie yesterday was telling us that we don't really know what's going on. Maybe, sorry, we spend a lot of time in acacia cyclops and the other acacias measuring all sorts of parameters to try and get to understand what's happening to our agents, what's happening to the plant as the agents take effect. And I want to show you some of the results that we're getting. Before biological control, if you went into an acacia thicket, I can guarantee you you would find somewhere between two and 10,000 seeds per square meter. That's the typical seed that. There, would, there should be more, in fact, because the amount of seed being produced, if it was nothing affecting it, would have accumulated much higher. But there are other role players in the system. Prominent amongst them is the civil guy here, the striped field mouse, which loves acacia sort of cyclop seeds and other acacia seeds. It makes up a huge proportion of their diet, and they're removing a lot of the seeds that have fallen to the ground. They even go into the trees and get the green pods and bring them down to the ground and uh, feed on there. They don't like the arrow for some reason, and that's an interesting point in itself but they certainly consume a lot of seed. The other key role player in all these acacia systems, of course, is fire, and we've seen lots of photos of fires, and, and, and that's a common thing. What happens after a fire in one of those thickets where we've got between two and 10,000 seeds is that most of those seeds are scorched, and the cuts we've made show at least 98% of the seed is scorched by the fire, so it's killed, it's destroyed. That leaves a residue, which is producing about 40 seedlings per square meter. So we're only 8% gone, that's enough to produce a whole lot of seedlings. We measured survival rates of seedlings down to about 10%, so 90% of the seedlings die for a reason to be themselves. But that leaves four new plants per square meter, and that's plenty to replenish the thicket that was there before the fire, and very quickly the canopy closes again, and you're back to where you started. Very importantly though, each fire resets the clock because two years after a fire, the seed that wasn't scorched has germinated and there's no seeds left in the soil. And if you go and pour there, it's bad. Now biological control becomes the important role there. What we're seeing, and we're looking at areas where there's been fires in the last 10 years, because Desinura has been in the system for 10 years now, you can go to those thickets and there's no seed left in the soil still. It should have been accumulating and it should be getting up into the hundreds, if not the thousands, by 10 years, but it's not. The soil is still bad. We're not seeing any effect. People are still seeing a case of cyclops plentiful, and they're assuming that the insects haven't done anything. But I can guarantee you, and I'm going to propose that this plant should be put on the endangered species list, because the next fire, there's going to be no seed there to replace it. Now, I'm sticking my neck out there, but I'll be very surprised if these things suddenly reappear when we get the next fires. The other very important thing that the agents are doing is that they're stopping long-range dispersal of the weed. So we get these vistas where this plant's it's, it's, a, it's intermeshed with phagos and moving the seeds from those plants into these open areas has practically stopped. There's no seeds to be dispersed. It's not happening. The few that are dispersed are 
taken up by mice very quickly. And if you look in these areas, there's no seed about there either. So that's a very important effect too. Two effects. No seeds where the thickets are and no spread of seeds. Invasion species. Right. Just finishing off. Black bottle, we're all familiar with black bottle. And we have a cousin of the deaths in Euron Cyclops, which is really coming into its own right now on Acacia Vernsia. We've had the seed beetle about for quite a long time, plodding along, destroying a lot of seed, but on its own, not doing enough to really uh, bring the problem down to any manageable level. This little fly is not quite as prolific as its cousin on Cyclops because it only has one generation a year, and so its buildup has been much slower. They both were released in the same 2002, and it's been a long lag phase before we're starting to see really high levels of gorings on the tree, and now we are. And here's a typical, actually it's an excellent example, but we would say it's typical. Uh, if you look at the trees, left of this dotted dash line, on the upper left, is this year's rose, and this is not, so the trees in the last year were there. Look at the pod loads there. That senior was in the, on the plants, but there were just no levels of galling. This year, you cannot find a single inflorescence that hasn't been galled. There's no seed developing. And that's, as I say, that's a typical example. It is typical. That's what we're seeing. And we're measuring seed range from these trees. It's gone down from hundreds, even up to a thousand per square meter, to less than one or two. Suddenly, there's no seed left in the system. Now, it's not going to happen overnight. Lindsay is going to be with us for a long time. But we can look backwards now and say, remember the good old days when we used to get zillions of seeds buried in these trees? Now there's none. Clearly, something's going to change as we go along. So, what's the bottom line? Don't jump to conclusions. That website I showed you at the beginning, somebody's jumped to a conclusion without doing the right investigation. If you want to pronounce on what biocontrol is doing, make sure you understand what it's about. Don't just form an opinion and, and it's proud it. doesn't do anybody any good. Be patient. It's not going to happen overnight. What we're doing now isn't for us, it's for our children and grandchildren. I think they're going to benefit. And I, sorry, I'll just reiterate. Keep looking backwards. Ask the question, what would it have been like if we didn't have biological control? Don't say, what's it still like because we've got biocontrol? And you'll have a totally different perception of the problem. And I think that's illustrated quite nicely by this. Keep looking backwards. <laughs> the guys are looking forward and aren't seeing the same things. <laughs> and I'd just like to thank Fiona and Green, who currently work on these projects with me. Uh, Judy Fox and Relay, who are former colleagues, and they moved on to other pastors, and funding from working for Water Jackets on Trust and GCT. Thank you very much. And to those few of you who might be wondering with this guy, Fraj, okay, I'm Rebo Magoba from Agricultural Research Council in Victoria. And we do have one, I mean, space for one question for Dr. Dogma. Looking back. Okay, there's one for you. There's one for you. Oh, sorry. No, it's just a compliment. Thank you, sir. I think it's, it's amazing. Yeah, I agree. Well, the insects are the guys who, they're the heroes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Dogman, and I think this is one of the...